Well, look at all them bright lights down there in Damascus, Virginia down there. Hello, everybody. I'm Stargazer Mark, and we're so glad you're with us to share some backyard astronomy on Stay Curious at the American Space Museum. I'm outside, though, today looking at the beautiful twilight coming in from White Top Mountain, which is above Damascus, Virginia, on the Tennessee border, a place I've been many times, and a beautiful photograph by my friend George Fleener, who grew up there in the Bristol, Tennessee area, but now lives over in Bradenton. And kind of see you here soon at the museum, George. Well, every Monday we're bringing you some backyard astronomy to help you stay star curious as well as staying curious following our program here at our nonprofit American Space Museum. And today we're going to talk about some sky phenomenon that you're going to see any night. And we're going to talk about those beautiful planets that are up in the sky right now. And uh, thank you, Jessica Galloway, for being here behind the controls. Uh, Marty Winkle, our other co-producer, uh, is off today. So, uh, and I've just enjoyed taking a few pictures here at this gorgeous twilight here as the sun is setting. Uh, and, and this is a gorgeous place to be. However, the light pollution, as you can see, from even down at some of these sleepy little towns in southwest Virginia is starting to affect and take away the night. So uh, that's an issue we'll talk about later, light pollution. But right now we're enjoying a beautiful fall evening uh, here on White Top Mountain. And things we're going to see, well, let's see. First of all, it's going to get dark early. And... <clears throat> Daylight savings went into effect on Sunday, and maybe the only people that really like that are astronomers like me because it gets dark early enough that we can stargaze till 8 or 9 o'clock and get to bed early. In the wintertime, I mean summertime, it doesn't even get dark till 9 or 10 o'clock at night. Golfers love that. Gardeners love that. Tennis players, but astronomers don't particularly. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, uh, so, uh, But if daylight savings were always in effect, this is a little story I looked up that um, daylight saving time came about uh, to conserve energy during World War I, and then it became a national standard in the 1960s. Uh, but we don't save that much electricity anymore, particularly with it getting earlier at night, and more people are up at 5, 6, 7 o'clock at night than they are at 5, 6 in the morning, obviously. Uh, but a compelling case can be made that if daylight savings times were always in effect, on the left is days that have a reasonable sunrise time at 7 o'clock or earlier, all right? And uh, the darker areas are where it's unreasonable. It, it's uh, more like uh, uh, 6.30 or, or 6. But on the right-hand side, days with measure with reasonable sunset time, 5 o'clock or later, across the whole country, we would have at least sunset by 5.30, 6 o'clock. Because uh, December 22nd, the summer solstice, sun's going to set about 5, 4.30 in the afternoon, and it's already setting at 5.30. So just a little case to make. Do you like daylight savings time? Do you wish that we didn't fall back? Or did you enjoy that 25-hour day with an extra long nap on Sunday? But uh, either way, this is all caused by the tilt of our, sun, our, our Earth's axis. Otherwise, the days would always be the same. Well, let's look at another little phenomenon here that I want to share with you. Any night when the sun sets, no matter where you're at, you go outside and you look opposite where the sun set and look to the east, and you're going to see a scene similar to this that I photographed, a pinkish line across the sky, the pink above of the atmosphere, and that dark band right near the horizon. Well, this dark band here is actually the Earth's shadow that's cast into space because the sun has set and the Earth's shadow is reaching up in the sky. This pink layer is an atmospheric layer that they call the Belt of Venus. And my friend Paul Lewis, who's an astronomy outreach at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville, he posts almost every day a Belt of Venus. I think he's happy to see this not cloudy in Tennessee. But uh, that's his thing. We all have our little things on Facebook. He loves showing you the belt of Venus, which pertains to the goddess Venus, not the planet Venus. And the belt more describes in ancient times a brassiere that Venus would have been wearing. Uh, 
uh, when she wasn't posing nude for all those sculptures that she made, okay? Uh, but uh, this is called the Belt of Venus after the goddess Venus. It's peachy pink, and you can see it most nights, and it fades away quickly as this dark shadow of the earth reaches up to the sky. And then it blends in with the night sky. So beware the Belt of Venus uh, at sunsets. And then how about this? You all seen this, crepuscular rays. They can be so dramatic. Crep Puscular rays, crepe, puscular, okay? This is the shadow of those clouds on the horizon throwing a shadow up in the sky against the clouds that are up there. We forget wherever the sun shines, there has to be a shadow behind that object, and that's what's going on here. Sometimes these clouds aren't seen because they're below the horizon, and that really gets freaky. Uh, but how dramatic they can be. And over the ocean, we can often see the anti-crepuscular rays, you see those uh, yellowish rays coming down there, and there's dark ones in there as uh, someone's walking across the ocean there, Atlantic Ocean, Cocoa Beach, picture I took a while back. Those are even cooler to see. They, they have gone from completely where the sun sets all the way across the horizon uh, to show you anti-crepuscular rays. Fun to photograph, actually quite challenging to photograph. Well, by uh, our uh, godfather at our museum, Charlie Mars, who we all love and, and is a great guy and has been part of our museum for over 20 years that we've been here, called me up one day and he said, Mark, I think I saw a UFO in the sky. Jessica, what are we trying to get me to do? Tilt that mic towards me. Oh, okay. Tilt the mic towards me there. There we go. Uh, Charlie Mars, our, our chairman of the board, called me up. Uh, one day and says, I think I saw a UFO, Mark. I go, well, describe it, Charlie. And he said, well, it was moving from east to west, uh, which uh, most satellites go west to east. And it was moving slowly and it was really bright. And I didn't know what it was and it didn't zigzag and no one was waving at him. So I said, I'm not sure what you saw, Charlie, but it made a good topic today to, to talk about when you see things in the sky that you don't know what they are. Sometimes you can figure out what they are pretty easily, and I have a chart for that. This here are the Starlink satellites crossing the sky. There you see four or five of them as they're etched across the sky. This is a time exposure of probably a couple minutes that like fingernail painting when you open up a lens, uh, anything moving that's bright will leave a, a, a track around it and the trees just keep getting brighter in the landscape there. So here is a kind of a fun little chart to how to identify that light in the sky. Uh, and this has been inspired by our chairman of the board, Charlie Mars. First, is it really big? If it's really big, you go to the left side, are your eyes burning? <laughs> if it, they are, you're looking at the sun or the moon, okay? But you go on the right side, is it moving? Is it really big and moving? Well, first you want to know, is it twinkling? And if it's twinkling on the right-hand side, it could be a star and it's an illusion like Venus twinkles so violently you think it's moving. Uh, but on the other side, uh, is it uh, quickly, uh, is it moved so quickly you almost missed it? Well, if it was, you go on down the line and you reach that it's either a meteor or a bright, bright meteor is called a fireball, and a super bright meteor that blows up, as you see, it's called a bolide. All right. But we go the other side of, is it moving? Is it twinkling? Is there a blinking light? If it's a blinking light, it's probably an aircraft. All right. Are there any astronauts waving at you? If it would be, it'd be the International Space Station. Ha, ha, ha. Satellites and International Space Station are one direction and, and move very smoothly and steadily. Now, they can change brightness when they're directly overhead because that's a shorter distance between you and the ISS directly overhead than when you see it on the horizon. It's actually 200 miles away uh, or, or more than 1,000 miles away maybe when you see it on the horizon. Directly overhead, it's just 250 miles away and will be at its brightest. Uh, if it's fuzzy, it's, uh, it could be a comet. All right, if it's got a, an attached light uh, to it that's not blinking, this could be a boat out there uh, that you're looking above the horizon. And, of course, a planet is usually not twinkling, has steady light because it's reflected light. 
uh, from the sun off of it. And that doesn't, that's not a point source that twinkles like a star. So they twinkle less in there. So fun little chart there. But here's a serious chart for you. We always talk about, and we're going to talk about here in just a minute, that tonight the moon is five degrees away from the planet Venus. Well, what do we mean by degrees? Well, it's just 360 degrees is a circle. 180 degrees is from horizon to horizon. 90 degrees is from directly overhead to horizon. Okay, simple geometry. 45 degrees is half of that. But you use your hands and hold out your outstretched hands, like I tell you all the time, to cover up the moon all the time is, a, is less than a degree or, or your little finger outstretches a degree apart. Your fingers like that are three degrees apart or five degrees apart. A clenched fist is 10 and your fingers like this, which I can't barely do. The rock and roll sign is 15 degrees apart. And you know, I can't do that. Do Jessica's that. given me the Vulcan sign there. And for the life of me, i I can't do that. <laughs> I can't even do it. I can't even make him do it. We'll have to tape him. There you are. There we are. <laughs> Barely. Okay. What a crude Vulcan sign. But uh, that would probably be about uh, 10 degrees uh, uh, across there. So you see the Big Dipper. The pointer stars are just five degrees apart. And that would be three fingers like that. All right. So uh, a good little tool to use when we're talking a lot about how many degrees objects are away from each other in the sky. And we usually talk about that when planets are close to the moon. Like, uh, all right, we'll see a picture of that in a minute. Well, here's another sky phenomenon to beware about because we're in the middle of a moon dance. All right. The moon is a crescent phase going to first quarter on Friday, full moon uh, a week from Friday. And you're likely particularly up in the north where you got all these temperature inversions of cold air meeting warm air, you're going to get a ring around the moon. And this is called a lunar halo. And it is from one at, from the moon's edge to the one side is um, 22 degrees. So it's 45, 44 degrees across uh, in, in diameter. It's always that, always. There's also a ring around the sun. That's always 22 and a half degrees radius, okay? Why is that? Because of the ice crystals that form this are, are, are polygons, and they look like rectangles with sides on them, and there's such a precise uh, uh, prism that they're reflecting this light exactly like this. It's some physics of the, of the atmosphere. Now, Jessica showed me a beautiful so, uh, solar, solar one that she, she photographed. We'll use that one day on there. But if you see the sun setting and on each side of it are real bright, uh, 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 real bright areas, bright, bright, bright there, those are called sun dogs. And those are right across from each other. And they would, if a line through them would go right through the sun, and those are called sun dogs. Also, you can sometimes see a sun pillar that's, that goes right down from the sun. Very beautiful. Sun oh, pillars are way cool too. We, so we saw light pillars in when I lived in Montana. Oh yeah. There uh, and and uh, uh, Jessica said she saw light pillars in Montana. And different areas of the country have different phenomena. Like we're known for these here in Florida with these crepuscular rays because of the the the, the flat land and we do have a lot of clouds uh, at the horizon in the evenings and it can be very spectacular. Just like I guarantee you, some of you are going to see a ring around the moon in this week uh, uh, and it's caused by ice crystals and that's a whole other uh, backyard astronomy that we'll do about atmospheric phenomenon as we have a beautiful moon dance in the sky this week where the moon's going on the right hand side from a crescent phase to first quarter between first quarter and uh, full moon we call it gibbous so also when the and when the moon rises exactly when the sun sets that is full moon and then it rises about 50 minutes later each night. Now the next full moon uh, we're going to be talking about is going to be a lunar eclipse but it's going to be at 2 in the morning till 5 in the morning. So I don't know how many of you will be up to see that but we'll talk about that on our backyard astronomy next week with me stargazer Mark. Here is the first quarter moon through a nice telescope, a photograph I took not too long ago. This is the way the moon, moon is going to look Friday. Okay, 
in uh, uh, actually, it, well, it occurs uh, uh, Thursday morning. It's going to be first quarter, and it's going to be four degrees below Jupiter, okay? So at nighttime, they're going to be about five degrees apart, Jupiter and the moon, and that's three fingers up in the sky. Is uh, The width of those is about five degrees. And now when you're looking at the west, of course, the bright star is Venus, Saturn and Jupiter. You see them directly looking south. Venus is going to be in the, the constellation Sagittarius this week, close to some star clusters like called like the Lagoon Nebula. Astrophotographers will be wanting to get an image of that, though it's hard because Venus is so bright and the Lagoon Nebula in Sagittarius is so dim. But uh, maybe next week we'll show you one of those attempts there. But that red line going through there is the ecliptic, okay? That is where you always see the planets and the moon and the sun, all right? And you're always going to look south looking at the ecliptic. We're here in Titusville. So looking towards Miami or Miami you're all, is where you're going to be looking to see the, the planets and the moon. You will never see the planets in the moon looking north like I am right now towards Jacksonville, okay? It just won't happen. Uh, if you're, or look towards the North Pole or wherever you're, you're, you're living, looking north, you're not going to see the sun and the moon up there because the earth is tilted 24 degrees, and this is why everything is tilted back towards the south of the sky, the ecliptic. So that's a good point, and that's a backyard astronomy thing that you can always see. You would want your own backyard to be free of trees at this ecliptic area so that they don't, uh, so you get a good view of that. So if you're a homeowner, and uh, that might be a consideration to cut down a tree to see more of this. And of course, we want you to plant two trees when you cut down one. But we don't encourage you to do that unless it's just really uh, uh, in your way. Here is another photograph by my friend George Fleener, who I remind you took this gorgeous panorama. Uh, for White Top Mountain. This is v uh, the moon at the top and Venus last month, and they're going to look like this tonight, okay, with Venus again about uh, five degrees. How, how far is it going to be below? Um, didn't write that down tonight. I think it's about 10 degrees there. Yeah, five or 10 there. Get your hand out there and figure that out. And thank you for letting me share your pictures there, George. This is what Venus looked like a couple weeks ago by Johnny Horn up in North Carolina, another stargazer friend of mine. It will now be more of a crescent phase, and we'll show you a picture of that uh, on the next Stay Curious uh, Stargazer Backyard uh, next Monday. But it's going to get a crescent phase because the moon is coming between the Earth and the sun, so we're starting to see the backside of it. Coincidentally, it gets its brightest, though we see less uh, uh, there. Here's gorgeous Jupiter that is the brightest star looking to the south. And uh, Saturn is to its right, uh, about 20 degrees across from it. So that'd be two fists across, 10, 20, okay, to get to there. Of course, you're not going to miss it. It's the only bright yellow star in there. These are two beautiful pictures by Derek Demeter, planetarium director at M.O. Bueller. We'll have Derek on our show soon. And here's another beautiful photo by Johnny Horn of the moon of Jupiter. It's red spot. You see the, the two moons on either side of it. And at the top, that black area is a shadow from the moon in the upper right. Now, I show you this sketch that I made about the same time Johnny took that picture. Just to inspire you to do your own thing. I love sketching Jupiter, the moon, Mars when it's close. Uh, nothing scientific here. It's just my impression of it. There's the red spot, the black dot. There's the one of the, the moons that projected on there. And this is how I saw it in a 10-inch in a telescope uh, in a period of about an hour, making a quick sketch, at several quick sketches at the telescope, and then going inside and making a better color rendition of it. Again, this is for me and nobody else, but you know what? It's like writing a poem, writing a story, taking a photograph. Uh, I enjoy the old school sketching and inspire you to try that same. Here is Saturn through a regular telescope that we hope that you come to our museum. We're going to start doing some stargazing nights here. Uh, we'll advertise those. But there's a pretty good shot of Saturn by my friend Ronnie Sherrill. He's in Statesville, North Carolina. <clears throat> 
And this is really a cool picture that I've never seen before. My friend George Fleener took this of Neptune. Neptune is that bluish ball there. It's only two and a half billion miles away. The light took more than 40 minutes to reach George's CCD chip, okay, from leaving the surface of it. Uh, and a 10-inch uh, uh, cast of grain telescope there for you astronomers out there. But that's about the same. Oh, tease you there. That's about the same uh, uh, size right there. If, if, if uh, Saturn's that size, uh, so far away, Neptune is that size, okay? Well, we hope that you've all enjoyed this little moon dance across the sky here as we look at Van Morrison's uh, uh, famous album from the 60s, believe it or not. Uh, uh, and uh, I've wrote columns about over 100 songs named after the moon. I mean, there's hundreds of them. And I just I just put like the top hundred down, and Moon da Moon Dance is is right up there for me with Picasso Moon, and uh, which is a Grateful Dead song. What's your favorite Moon Dance song? If you got one, Fly Jessica. Me to the moon, Frank Sinatra. Fly me to the moon, Frank Sinatra. Yep, yep. So we could hum that out. Fly me to the moon, and take me play among the stars. As we have a Moon Dance around here, and we certainly appreciate you joining us on Stay Curious to Stay Star Curious with me, the backyard astronomer, Mark Marquette. Tomorrow we'll bring you more space history, astronaut birthdays, and more tales from our wonderful museum, all to bridge the space between us.